Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to this webinar from the Centre for English Identity and Politics at Southampton University. Uh, I'm John Denham, I'm the director of the Centre, and as you know, today's topic is Winning England. Why England? Uh, in part, of course, because England's size means that it has a huge influence on the outcome of UK elections. But more important, England's politics are different. In 2019, Boris Johnson had a UK majority of 80, but that rested on an England majority almost twice as big, 156. It was England that wanted the Conservatives, not the rest of the UK. And what's more, when you dig into it, different social groups, different parts of the electorate often voted for different parties in each nation. Now, today we're not trying to predict the outcome of the next election. Uh, if you want, you can find plenty of opinion polls, MRP projections of constituency results and a discussion of how reliable polls are this far out all over the Internet. What we really want to do is dig beneath that to look at the underlying factors that will influence different sections of the electorate and which will ultimately determine the result. Uh, as may become clear, there's not a clear consensus on what has happened in the past. Looking at recent election analyses, some have emphasised demographics of age, education or home ownership. Others have focused on social and economic values. Others, including myself, have looked at the role of national identity and related ideas of national sovereignty. So there's a lot to try to unpick in the next uh, hour and a half. Uh, today's panel is superbly equipped to unpick these complex issues. Uh, Lawrence McKay is a colleague from Southampton University. Uh, Matt Goodwin is from the University of Kent. Uh, Ailsa Henderson from the University of Edinburgh and Paula Surridge from the University of Bristol. Uh, they all have also long and impressive titles that go with other jobs and positions they hold, but I'll leave it there and you can look them up uh, if you want to have more information. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Lawrence, who's been looking at some of the trends over the last 20 years. So, Lawrence, over to you. Uh, sorry, let's just minimise. I need to put my video on. Uh, OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks, John, for that introduction. Um, I'm... Is this sharing? Yes, I'm oh, screen yes. sharing and sharing the window. You need to go on slideshow, Lawrence. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, so, um, this presentation is uh, taking a bit of a, a long-term view on uh, the factors that have driven uh, voters from different identity groups, particularly that um, that group that sees themselves as uh, more English than they feel British, um, uh, using things like the British Social Attitude Survey and the British Election Study, which give us a really um, good long-term picture of uh, how these groups have, uh, have evolved in their voting behavior and attitudes. Um, so uh, the first thing I just want to show you is um, uh, graphs or a couple of pair of graphs that um, that uh, John and I made for um, a unpublished paper on uh, the simple um, percentage of the the vote share among people who voted um, from uh, each of these groups towards each party. Um, so the um, the first thing I want to pick up on here uh, is the among the more English group. Um, the Conservatives have gained steadily, so that's that um, the circular black dots. The Conservatives have gained steadily um, from around uh, 40% in uh, 2001 um, up to um, uh, nearly 50% in 2015. But then from 2015 to 2019, um, we see a real rocketing up of that um, Conservative vote share. Um, to where it's about 66% in 2019 among the more English group. And I think people hasn't fully been appreciated how dramatic that, that shift has, has been. And that's one of the key things we want to explore here. Also, um, however, if you look at the more British group, um, you actually see that Labour, even in 2019, which is a disastrous election, of course, um, was still in the lead among the more British group. The Conservatives uh, conversely had not gained, even compared to their 2001 vote share among the more British group. Um, the third thing I want to pick up on here is um, that the uh, more English group, um, even though they have steadily trended towards the Conservatives over time, um, they've also shown a, a tendency to vote with uh, competitor parties on 
what we might call the um, the radical right. So we have uh, UKIP um, particularly making a strong breakthrough with this party with this um, section of the electorate in 2015. Uh, I'm not sure why that moved. Um, and uh, and also, um, although that's not shown in this graph, uh, the Brexit party its vote in 2019 uh, in the European elections where they actually won um, a uh, plurality of the of the voters um, was heavily reliant on that more English group. Um, so uh, those again are just the trends summarized that I've already discussed. Um, so to look for um, possible uh, causes of this, um, the first thing uh, that I turn to, heavily um, influenced by the kinds of work that um, Paula has been doing on values, um, is the economic and social values, which we uh, um, have in a, a long term. We have long term trends on this from the British Social Attitude Survey. Uh, if you're not familiar with these items, um, it's possible that Paula will discuss them more. Um, but essentially, um, we ask a, a series of questions um, which allow us to determine how economically left wing as opposed to um, right-wing free market people might be, and also um, how liberal they might be on social issues as opposed to authoritarian. So, for example, um, tough on crime and, um, uh, for example, um, things like death penalty would be seen as a canonical example of um, authoritarian attitudes. Um, so the first thing uh, to note here is that uh, even though uh, they have been um, more in the Labour camp, um the or sorry more in the conservative camp um the more Brit the more english are not more economically right wing there have been very um small differences in their economic attitudes over time and that stayed pretty much the same through the entirety of this period it's social attitudes um, as you might expect that distinguish these groups a little bit more um that uh group that difference did exist uh, even in the early 2000s, but it's become a bit more pronounced. However, the widening of that gap is actually more due to um, the movement. So all of these groups have moved in a more liberal direction, um, but it's uh, 2012, kind of around that point in time. Um, the uh, final thing I want to show you uh, here in terms of these long term trends is um, attitudes to immigration, which is, you know, um, has been a uh, defining issue of, of British politics, um, has um, contributed to uh, the Brexit vote, for example, um, and has been a, an, a cause of uh, political realignment. Um, the uh, differences that, that we can observe here, well, we're plotting two things. So. One is um, a measure of um, how negative they are about immigration, particularly captured through this question, which is the only question that's available over, over a long period of time, um, whether immigration is good for the economy or not good for the economy, um, and also whether people see it as the most important issue. So, right, a measure of uh, what we call salience. Um, so, on the uh, in terms of their underlying attitude, right, um, there has been a um, a, a tendency for the more English to be more negative about immigration. Um, so, for example, in 2001, you actually see about 90% um, of the more English saying that uh, immigration is not good for the economy. Um, that has steadily ticked down over time among all groups, um, but the more British have been a bit more less likely to endorse that attitude. Um, in the round 2015, again, we see um, quite a big shift, um, particularly among the more British. Uh, to be um, less negative or more positive about immigration. Um, the more English doing the same thing, but uh, at a slower rate. Still about 60% of them saying that um, they are uh, they feel immigration is uh, bad for the economy. Um, also, in terms of the most important issue, um, there was a steady increase over the 2000s and, uh, and peaking in 2015 that um, particularly those more English voters saw immigration as the most important issue. Um, and that has declined um, quite a bit since uh, 20, 2015, but the uh, the gap is still evident. Um, also, um, we have some information. Um, this is also gathered from um, John's own uh, polling with the Centre for English Identity and Politics, um, which shows um, 
uh, essentially the attitudes to governance by um, different identity groups because you know I, I kind of um, the the theory we're moving to thinking that well perhaps values um, doesn't explain everything um, because the values gaps aren't all that big the immigration gaps are big but also the salience of it varies a lot over time so is it going to affect votes the same way over time attitudes to governance um, we see um, also quite pronounced gaps um, whereby uh, the English have quite a strong desire to see England represented. So um, they will say, um, for example, that it's important that parties stand up for England. About 90% of them will say that, but only about 50% of the more British will say that. They're also a bit unhappy with some aspects of the devolution settlement, something Elsa um, is, um, has published a lot of excellent work on. Um, and uh, they support some constitutional changes that strengthen England's voice, albeit that they, they avoid some more radical ones such as English independence. Um, now, even though the Tories gained so much in uh, in 2019, we know that um, it's a party that is really struggling on the national stage with its polling figures, perhaps down in the low 20s. And it seems that the Tories stand to lose a lot among this bloc. Um, so we see that even though 66% of the more English voted Conservative in 2019, um, we actually see that 13% uh, of them, even though they voted Conservative, actually support another party, uh, and further 16% either had no identification or weren't, didn't see themselves as Conservatives. So that's the reason like this, this vote will not have consolidated around the Conservatives in the way they might have wished post-Brexit. And finally, the, the last thing I want to point out is um, you know, obviously, we live in a, uh, a system where geography uh, matters a lot and where votes um, are distributed um, uh, is going to be influential to the outcomes of the election in terms of votes to seats. Um, I looked at the, uh, the most marginal seats that the Conservatives currently hold um, and which ones had particularly strong English identity. And the thing that pops out here is this is essentially a list of Red Bull seats that only recently uh, fell to the Conservatives and could well trend back to Labour given some factors such as demographics. So, um, uh, you know, you see Barrow and Furness there, you see Bolsover, Dennis Skinner's seat, um, or Old Seat Lee, Andy Burnham's Old Seat. Um, there's so many such examples of seats where the Conservatives are vulnerable if indeed they are losing out among these more English voters. Uh, so, thank you very much for listening. I look forward to any questions. Lawrence, thank you very much indeed. That's a great uh, introduction. And um, I'm going to move uh, straight on to Matt for, for his take. Matt Goodwin. Thank you, uh, John. Thanks for organising um, the conference. And uh, just to say, say at the outset, um, uh, I've, learned, I've learned a great deal from John's writing over the years on, on Englishness and English identity. And Lawrence, thanks for your presentation I learned a lot during that what I wanted to do in eight minutes or so is essentially summarize um, an argument that I'm trying to make in a in a new book which is coming out in uh, three weeks uh, called values voice and virtue um, which basically speaks very loudly to the debates over Englishness some of the things Lawrence has just mentioned and I'm sure some of the things that Elsa and um, Paula are going to talk about um, and it sort of hinges on this question of what caused um, this political realignment over the last decade, which I think was really shaped by three big revolts, uh, the rise of national populism, the vote for Brexit, and then Boris Johnson's uh, election uh, victory in 2019. And obviously, the consensus today is very much along the lines of, of that, that, that post-Brexit realignment has essentially come to an end or that the economic cleavage in politics is reasserting itself at the expense of the cultural cleavage in politics. I'm less convinced by that for reasons that I'll talk about. Um, but what the book really tries to do is bring, bring together a lot of research on what I'm arguing are the new drivers in politics. And, and really the first, which Lawrence has already alluded to, is the continuing salience of the value divide in British politics, which is rooted in, in education-based polarization more than anything, that we still have this growing drift between a university-educated minority uh, and a non-graduate majority, and that that rift is especially acute when you drill down and look at elite graduates uh, versus non-graduates on cultural questions that, you know, we've all spent a lot of our time looking at, not just uh, the issue of Brexit, but also 
um, uh, how the, the, the Remain Leave divide now maps onto a whole range of other issues, uh, how we feel about diversity, how we feel about immigration, how we feel about the pace of social change, and how we feel about national identity, Britishness, and Englishness within it. And if you look at how this value divide maps onto things like Britishness, um, it's quite clear that actually we still have some very deep-rooted differences in how people conceive of their national identity. And as Lawrence has just mentioned, those who identify foremost with Englishness are more concerned about migration and its effects on the country, do want to slow down the pace of social change, do hold a more ethno-traditional conception of who they are. They're much more likely to stress things like the importance of shared culture, shared traditions um, of uh, ancestry to some extent, but certainly more ascribed characteristics uh, within their national identity. And none of that is really likely to go away anytime soon. There's certainly a long-term trend that's taking place, but, but I would argue many people exaggerate the pace of that, uh, that change. Um, in short, we still have large numbers of voters today who feel that their values, um, their more culturally conservative values, are not represented in the political system or by the elite graduates who tend to dominate most of the institutions within British society. And we can see this also in some recent polling we've just done looking at the degree to which people support particular policies and the degree to which they feel neither left nor right represents them on those policy issues. And the three most uh, popular policies um, were firstly the uh, belief that political correctness has gone too far. Uh, secondly, the belief that immigration should be tighter, a view, by the way, still held by more than half of the country. And thirdly, that Britain, Britain's distinctive identity, culture and history should be promoted more uh, than it is currently being promoted. Now, had I re um, reframe that question in terms of English uh, identity, culture and history being promoted, uh, I dare say we would, we would have found uh, the, the exact same thing. And this maps very neatly onto work that was done by YouGov quite recently, who found indeed the same three policies, well, three very similar policies were uh, still, uh, still had considerable public demand, but were not adequately in the eyes of voters being represented. Uh, the justice system is not harsh enough. Immigration restrictions should be tighter. And thirdly, uh, Britain should not be militarily intervening in other countries. Uh, and so on that sort of upper right quadrant, we can still see uh, considerable um, support for values that people feel are not represented. And I think secondly, what, what, what's closely linked to that, and again, I think Lawrence and John have alluded to this, is, is a sense among many voters, especially English identifiers, that they don't really have much of a voice. And not only within our political system, which to be frank is dominated by uh, new middle class graduates who tend to share the same uh, set of values, but that they don't really have a voice in many other institutions in society, which also tend to be dominated by the very same groups from media to creative industries to cultural institutions uh, and so on and so on. And so, you know, the, the potential support for populism, for the post-Brexit realignment that we've, all, that we've all been living through is, is by no means diminishing uh, in a considerable way. I would argue rather it is in abeyance. It is simply, uh, you know, in essence, waiting to be mobilized. And you can see that clearly in the polling. If you look in, if you look at who's abandoned the Conservatives over the last three years, actually only about one in 10 of Boris Johnson's voters, maybe one in eight, uh, have switched to the Labour Party. A much larger number, about one third, uh, have drifted into apathy, are undecided. And those voters, we've been doing some work on those voters recently, very concerned about cultural questions, very concerned about migration, very distrustful of politics, a little bit more likely, as Lawrence pointed to, to be identifying as English rather than British. And so as we uh, come around the corner into the next general election campaign, where I dare say cultural questions will remain highly salient, uh, contrary to uh, some of the narratives uh, that are out there, I think actually uh, this, this concern over a loss of voice in politics uh, the extent to which certain voices have been excluded from our national conversation uh, will come back quite prominently. And lastly, I do think in our politics and 
Uh, Jeff Evans, Zach Grant, uh, Justin Guest and others have been doing some really good work on this, which I found very influential. Um, lastly, I think this divide over perceptions of virtue, perceptions of moral superiority or inferiority uh, is going to become more prominent in our politics. And you can see that most clearly in the politics of the United States and the rise of a much more aggressive identitarian politics. And John has talked about this in his essays on Englishness. Um, but more in particular, I think we are seeing the rise of a new moral hierarchy in politics, a new way in which members of the elite are trying to derive their sense of status, um, not simply from material uh, goods, but rather from uh, what Rob Henderson at Cambridge has called their luxury beliefs, uh, a radical progressivism, which is much more focused on um, differentiating different groups uh, and the value of those groups along the lines of uh, race, ethnicity, uh, and in some cases, as we see in the debate, over Englishness, national identity. There is a, a very visible asymmetry in how we talk about national identity within the UK. There is a tendency which English voters, sometimes for good reason, uh, have picked up on, which, which views Englishness and English identity as being in some ways morally uh, inferior to other forms of national identity uh, within the UK. And indeed, Jeff Evans, and I hope you won't mind me saying this because I was so impressed with the paper he's done with Zach Grant, uh, has shown this, that a perception, especially among Labour voters, especially in England, uh, a perception that Labour is no longer interested in representing the white working class relative to other groups in society, has indeed been a significant driver of their defection away from the Labour Party. Justin Guest has found very similar uh, findings with regard to similar groups in other Western democracies, and I found much the same uh, in, in my work with Roger Eatwell. So this sense of um, uh, some groups in British society being seen to be virtuous, being seen to be morally righteous, and other groups, especially English working class voters, cultural conservatives, those who do not have a voice within the institutions, being seen to be morally inferior, not being seen to be virtuous relative to other groups in society, will also, I think, remain a dominant feature in our politics. So these divides over values, voice and virtue, in my mind, are the divides that are going to carry us through the remainder of the 2020s and beyond. It won't just be about inflation and, and the cost of living. It won't just be about redistribution and public services. If you look across most Western democracies, if not all of them, the cultural dimension is likely to remain as pressing, as prominent as it has been during the 2010s. But I'll leave it there. I've hit my eight minutes. I'm sure we can go, go into discussion and debate about some of that. Matt, thank you very much indeed. You've opened up a whole series of other issues to build on what Lawrence has said. Just before I bring Ailsa in, uh, just to say to the audience, there is a Q&A function, uh, which you should be able to see on your screen. Do please put questions in there uh, to put to the panel. I, I will pose the questions as the chair because it's just simpler and quicker that way. But please do use the question and answer function. There's also a chat thing if people want to have a, a discussion or commentary as we go through the speakers. But now moving on, uh, next speaker is Ailsa. And I hope we have your slides ready to go. Yeah. Yep, Natasha's got them. Good. Perfect. Can we get, go to slideshow? Ah. It was working on my end. Give me just a second. No, Risha. Okay. <laughs> I'll just start talking. It's fine. And then the slides, you, you can, start, the slides can follow along. The slides will catch up. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about England vote choice and the union. And I, so I thought I'd, I'd focus on one aspect of, of vote choice, how it relates to attitudes to the union. All the data that I'm going to talk about are from the Future of England survey, the most recent one. Um, in that should say autumn 2022 and the previous year autumn 2021. If this interests you, there's uh, our Englishness book, which draws very heavily on uh, the Future of England survey. And also we've got a new report coming out with the UK and a changing Europe folks uh, in the next month or so that's called the ambivalent union. So in terms of what I'm gonna talk about, let's move to the second slide if we can. It's okay. We'll just we can just keep it up in the um, in the desk view. And oh gosh, there we are. Right, second one on then. 
Perfect. Okay. So I've spent the last 10 years of my academic career arguing that we need to pay attention to England as England. So it might not make sense what I'm about to do, but, but we wanted to know how voters in England would vote if they could cast a ballot in devolved elections. And we were particularly interested in the behavior of those who could support parties with the same name uh, if that was an option available to them. So we asked a third of the sample, how would you vote if you were able to vote in Scottish elections? We asked how they'd cast their ballot in a constituency contest. Uh, we asked a third about the Welsh Senate elections and we asked a third about Northern Ireland. I'm interested in the first instance in those who could cast a ballot for an identical party, or not an identical party, but a party with the same name. So I'm interested in Scotland and Wales in the first instance. Now, why, why is this not a colossal waste of time, given that we can't move the English electorate from one part of the state to the other? I think it's an, an interesting exercise, first of all, because it helps us to understand partisanship through a different lens than we normally understand it. In a highly partisan system, it wouldn't really matter whether you were living in England or Scotland or Wales. If you were a Labour voter and you had a strong sense of partisan identification, you would vote for the Labour Party regardless of where you lived. Uh, and so it helps us to understand how partisan the system is across uh, across the piece. It also helps us to understand whose partisanship travels and whose doesn't. So it helps us to understand partisanship. And it also helps us to identify fault lines within parties at the moment, but also possible future fault lines in parties. So who moves and who doesn't and how are they different? Uh, so in Scotland, what we can see, conservatives hold on to about 43% of their vote. They lose a little bit to other parties. The balance, however, is a large portion, a proportion of people saying they don't know how they would vote if they could cast a ballot in Scotland. Labour holds on to fewer of its votes uh, uh, among English voters if they were to relocate to Scotland. Uh, they hold on to about a third of their vote. And one in five English Labour voters say that they would cast a vote for the SNP if they lived in Scotland. And I'll come back to that. If we look at Wales, one third of the Conservative English voters say they would continue to vote for the Conservative Party if they moved to Wales. But one in 10 English Conservative voters say that they would cast a ballot for Plaid. Uh, Labour holds on to more of its vote. It has a majority there, if barely 51% say they would continue to vote Labour. So for thinking back to the issue about partisanship, it's clear that the Conservative Party travels less well than Labour's on average, but Labour's travels much more unevenly than does the Conservative Party. If we're looking at fault lines and we look at distinguishing between those who stay and those who switch, Natasha, can you move on to the next little bit of text that's supposed to appear on that slide? If you press, there we go. Perfect. We can look at the uh, proportion of people who believe, who hold a British identity and look at those across the different groups. So we can look at English Labour voters who would stay with Scottish Labour and English Labour voters who would switch to the SNP. And what we find is that people who say that they would switch to the M uh, SNP are more British than those who say they would stay with Labour. And also, if we look at the Conservatives, we can see that 25% uh, describe themselves as British. If you're looking at English Conservative voters who say they would still vote for the Conservative Party if they moved to Wales. But if we look at the Conservative to Plaid switchers, then we're up at 56% British. So we, have a, we, we talk a lot about how Britishness means different things in different parts of the state with reference to how it relates to leave and, and remain votes. But it's also clear that British identifiers in different parts of the state have very different visions of the state. British identifiers in Scotland and Wales are the least likely to vote for Plaid and the SNP. And yet for English voters, the opposite is true. So I, that's a way of looking at England that tells us a little bit about what's going on in the state. If we can move to the next slide. Out of the realm of fantasy politics and into um, vote intention in still hypothetical elections, we, we know that voting preferences have changed from 2019. Um, we can see that Labour are managing to hold on to more of their voters than the Conservative Party, about 73% to 43%. For Conservative voters, there is some movement to other parties, about 10% to Labour, 12% to Reform, 7% say they would not vote in a sizable proportion, say that they don't know. 
Um, now, a lot of what explains these movements um, is can be rooted in uh, evaluations of competence, uh, evaluations of uh, economic policy or core values and many of the uh, issues that John mentioned in the blurb for this event. But I think it's worth exploring whether these different types of voters, these conservative to reform, conservative loyalists, conservative to labor and labor loyalists, whether these four different groups have different visions of the union. Next slide. So I've got three slides here. The first of them is on national identity. These are based on the Moreno question. So English includes those who describe themselves as English, not British, and more English than British. And the obvious, the opposite is true for the British identifiers. And we can see a clear linear relationship there as we move from conservative to reform switchers all the way over to labor, uh, to labor loyalists, with labor loyalists, the most British in the electorate, and conservative to reform switchers, the most English in the electorate. So conservative voters who say that they would leave the party have different identity profiles than those who say that they will stay. Next slide. Next, we can look at issues of solidarity. We can distinguish between economic solidarity and social solidarity. Economic solidarity is used uh, is measured using a question that asks taxes raised in England should be kept in England to help fund English public services or taxes raised in England should be shared with Scotland to help fund Scottish public services. That's the economic solidarity measure. The social solidarity measure, we have a series of questions asking about whether people support policy uniformity across the state or whether policy should be allowed to vary if different governments want different options. This is an index of all six items and it's the percentage of people saying that they think policy should be uniform across every single policy field that we give to people. On social solidarity, um, we can see that there is, um, first of all, we've got stronger support across any of the conservative groups. So conservative to reform, conservative loyal to loyalists, and conservative to labor and lower levels of support for policy uniformity among, um, among labor loyalists. So those switching to labor are slightly more like the labor profile, but still notice, notably conservative in their outlook. On economic solidarity, it's higher among labor voters than it is among conservatives. And those switching to labor retain very much a conservative outlook in their approaches to economic solidarity. Whereas if we're looking for those who are switching from conservative to the reform party, they are the least likely to say that they wish to share resources with Scotland. So in these two elements, both in identity and in terms of economic solidarity, those switching from conservative to reform very much have the identity and attitudinal profile of uh, a, a bit like UKIP of old. And last slide. We can also look at attitudes to unionism. I'm talking here about two different forms of unionism, ambivalent unionism. We measure this as a question asking, I want independence from my own part or the union as it is, is a priority for me uh, and I want to remain as it is. And the last ambivalent option, which is I don't want independence, but if one or more other parts of the state want to go their own way, then so be it. So the percentage for ambivalent unionism is the percentage indicating that they want that so be it answer. In muscular unionism, we have a whole battery evaluating muscular unionism in the future of England survey. This is one question from it. It's the question about how many nations there are in the state. People could choose between there is only one British, there is only one nation, the British nation. Uh, there are only nations existing below the level of the state. So in Scotland, Wales and England, uh, or a third option that says um, nations can exist at the level of the state and below. So you could have a British nation and a Scottish nation. So this is the percentage indicating that there is only one nation, the British nation. On the issue of ambivalence, half of Labour voters seem not all that bothered if one or more parts of the state go their own way. Labour's level of muscular unionism is particularly low. And because of these two things, you can see a meaningful difference between the attitudes of labor supporters and the attitudes of conservative supporters on the union. But if you look at conservative defectors, they are less muscular and more ambivalent than those who have stayed 
with the Conservative Party. So who is less likely to be poached by other parties from the Conservative Party? Those arguably most assertive in their unionism. So I think this connects to a bigger picture in the in the various reactions to claims that they're uh, that the two parties, the two main parties are fundamentally the same. There's been a lot of evidence saying, well, no, they're actually quite different in terms of core values, in terms of their attitudes to immigration, in terms of their sense of efficacy, as Matt outlined earlier. But to that, I would also add that they are very different in terms of their attitudes to the union. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Elsa. That's Great, and another huge set of dimensions to, to, to think about, although actually echoing with much more recent data, some of the things that in Lawrence's presentation about ideas of the, mm. ideas of the nation. Again, I would just say to people who are on the call, please do put some questions into the question and answer, otherwise um, you'll have to put up with me putting the questions and I'm sure yours will be better than mine. Uh, could we go straight on to Paula, please? Hello, have I got all that working? Hi, I pressed all the all right buttons in the right order. Um, I've taken a slightly different, I'll, I'll switch, to, oh, no, hold on, because it won't do it, that's it. I'll switch to that slide so people can be reading it while I'm talking. Um, I've taken a slightly different approach to the question because I suspected everybody else would be focusing very much on English identity. So I wanted to throw a slightly different um, perspective in. And I've really focused in on change since the last election. Um, so that's really where, where my focus is going to lie. And I've also honed in on these value scales that Lawrence talked about at the start. So I've left the items up there so people could have a quick read through them before I kind of launch into findings using them. Um, one thing I'd like to say, because it's featured a few times and, and Matt talked about it as well, a kind of this, this economics or culture kind of framing. Um, for me, economic attitudes can be values too so how you want the economy to be organized can also be a set of values it's not necessarily about self-interest and so I think of both of these dimensions as value dimensions and not necessarily as in competition with each other but rather as overlapping and forming distinct groups um, within the electorate and to that end I chop the electorate into a series of these groups now this is not, not entirely ad hoc, there is a logic behind it, which I won't go into for the, for the purposes of time, but basically cutting each of the two value dimensions, so the economic left-right and the um, liberal authoritarian dimension, into three groups. And this creates then nine potential positions. You can be in the left, centre, right on economics and the liberal, moderate, authoritarian in terms of the social dimensions. And what I've got in these two charts is, is data for England only. So I wanted to hone in on England for obvious reasons. And then data from the British election study that shows how these groups voted in the 2019 election. And then the most recent wave of that data is from last year's local election. So it's a little bit dated and I will bring things a bit more up to date um, at the end. But what I wanted to show was the groups that are moving the most. So in the 2019 election, it sometimes surprises people to discover that amongst those that were on the left economically, but who were socially authoritarian, the Conservatives won the bigger share of the vote in that group than the Labour Party, those who were on the left on economics. And that's where some really big shifts have taken place between the 2019 election and even as early as May last year. Um, the Labour Party were by May last year ahead in all of the groups on the left and were rapidly gaining ground um, in the centre um, as well. So that's a really big change and it shows those groups that are moving. The groups that are moving are the groups that Matt was talking about to a certain extent that we've been talking about throughout this, um, this presentation so far. Those that have economically left-wing views but who perhaps are not as comfortable with the very liberal agenda that they associated with Labour in 2019. And I'm going to go fast because I know you're probably fed up listening to us all talk by now. Um, that's just showing the change in those groups. And this this is really a mirror image of what you got if you looked at the change between 2019, 2017 and 2019. In 20 between 2017 and 2019, Labour lost support everywhere. 
um, but the most support in those left authoritarian and um, centre moderate groups. And we're now seeing the reverse of that. The Conservative Party are losing support everywhere, but they're losing it most on amongst those on the economic left. But I wanted to draw your attention to this because although, although uh, John said he didn't want us to play Mystic Meg and try and tell you who's going to win, at least I wanted to throw into the mix a little bit about what might change between now and an election. And Elsa, I think, highlighted that there's quite a lot of um, indecision amongst 2019 Conservative voters. And this is showing how much indecision there is within each values group. So which which of these values groups are most likely to still have some space to shift around, to still move between parties. And we can see it's the ones that have already moved the most also have the most indecision there. And in terms of what happens next for, for the next general election, it will depend critically on whether the, those voters that are undecided, undecided at this point, whether they head off back to the Conservatives, whether they flip in some cases back to Labour because they had been previous Labour voters, or I think particularly critically for the next election, whether they stay home and sit on their hands because actually they feel none of the parties quite represent the views that they have. So if I can just take two more slides to cast us into the future. Um, one to show how this polling's changed, because obviously I'm using data from May 2022, and one of the things that's happened since then is that gap between Labour and the Conservatives has really widened. And one of the reasons that's widened is because Labour are taking a bigger share of the Conservative vote than they were back in May 22. So the trends that I've shown you with the May 2022 data have basically accelerated a little bit since um, the... Um, trust, what should we call it, the trust interlude, um, really, really seemed to push voters towards Labour in a way that they hadn't been moving quite so much before. And what do I think is likely to happen next? Well, I think we need to look at where people are in terms of the things that really matter to them. And I know Matt spoke about this as well. This is, I, I, I stole some, a couple of slides from Ipsos because they were kind of pre-done and it saved me making charge myself, a bit of laziness kicking in. But the most important issues that people are citing at the moment are not issues that connect to that cultural dimension where Lawrence showed us you get big differences between the British and the English. They are on issues where you don't get those big differences between the British and the English. So top mention, this is the January one and perhaps doesn't surprise people, the top mention was the NHS, the crisis in the NHS. We, I think we could spend a whole hour talking about the relationship between that crisis and national identity um, in particular. But then it's about the economy, it's about inflation, with immigration just matching inflation amongst conservative voters, but not coming close to the economy or the NHS. And if we look at it broken down by social grade, immigration is not a big issue for either the ABC ones or the C2DEs. The core issues are those which load onto that economic set of values. And because of that, Labour is starting to pull ahead in the groups whose economic values align with the party position. So it's only if there's some kind of new shock, I think, that comes along to the system and makes something else a top priority for people that we're going to see that shift around. And I I don't believe anybody who's looked at British politics since 2016 would ever say anything is definitely going to happen. But it, there doesn't seem to be any obvious thing on the horizon that's going to change those. The NHS crisis isn't going away. Prices might stop rising as quickly, but they're not going to come down. These things aren't going to be quick fixes, even if we look to an election held right at the very last minute. I hope that was quick enough so that there's some time for discussion. Paula, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and that's been, I think people will agree, a fascinating set of insights. What, what's interesting to me is, is, is that people, all our speakers have taken a different view of the evidence, but actually there's a great deal of overlap between the way that people have portrayed, the way that people feel represented, the issues they're concerned about, but also... Um, some consistency in how things have been shifting in politics over the last couple of years. Let me go into the questions. I, I want to start with one which comes from an anonymous attendee. Um, 
saying, do you believe there are a lot of similarities between Britain now and Britain in the 1970s? And from that, would a return to Thatcherite politics be a sensible policy for the Conservatives to win more votes? Now, I'm not going to ask everybody to answer every question, but I, perhaps I could come to Paula and then Matt. Having looked at the data that you have, if you were constructing a Conservative Party that was going to do better than it is today, what would it look like? And would it be a Thatcherite Conservative Party? Or better say what we mean by Thatcherite, because there's Thatcherite social politics and there's Thatcherite economic politics, obviously. But what would a more successful Conservative Party look like? Uh, Paula, can I come to you first? So I think a more successful Conservative Party would look quite similar to the 2019 um, Conservative Manifesto, because I think things like the levelling up agenda were making headway, headways into representing some of the concerns of people who felt that their areas hadn't been talked about and, and, and things like that. But certainly not with Boris Johnson at the helm, because I think the reputation there has just been um, tarnished too much by everything that's happened since. But I certainly I don't think we could go back to a simple kind of cross reading of Thatcherism because society's changed so much since then. You know, we've got a much bigger graduate population and that's going to be constantly increasing. Society is going to be slowly but constantly liberalizing as those more educated generations move through. And we've, you know, we've already done many of the things that, that Thatcherism did in terms of changing to a um, housing market dominated by ownership, um, those kind of things. You can't do them again once you've done them once. So I don't think we should just be simply reading across. We need to look at society as it is, and it is a different kind of society, and political values are more fragmented, and parties need to learn to work out how to stitch those fragments together. Matt? Well, I was just thinking, in a way, we had a, a sort of real-world natural experiment with Liz Trust, which, um, you know, was was as close as perhaps in some ways we could we could get to a you know a sort of Thatcherite type model. Um, I mean, I remember looking at the data at the time and sort of coming to the view that trussonomics was a kind of at maximum ten percent position in terms of the electorate. I mean, cutting tax, doubling down on London financial services. Um, very comfortable with immigration, as we saw in the free trade deal or the proposed free trade deal with India. It just was not a vote winner at all for the Conservatives. And Partygate cost the party about six points in the polls. Trust cost them about 11 or 12. I mean, it was a real, real moment for the party. So I think where the Conservatives are trying to get to, which you can now see in the internal party dynamics, I was at an event last night with MPs, and there is a very clear desire to establish a new dominant faction within the Conservatives that is perhaps what we might call national conservatism rather than Thatcherite conservatism. There is an acceptance among both, cent you know, some more liberal conservatives, say, you know, um, who, from the Cameron era uh, and 2019ers who perhaps are closer to the sort of, you know, Nick Timothy type mould that actually the future of the party is in areas um, like the ones that fell to the party in 2019. So that means a stronger emphasis on, on national preference, on community, on, as Paula said, you know, levelling up, uh, coming up with a sort of a policy for England, for non-London England. And, and this has been exacerbated, John, I think, by the developments in Scotland Recently, I think Elsa will have thoughts on this. I think there's a growing realization in conservative land that this has made their job much harder, uh, made Labour's job much easier, and that perhaps non-London England is really the, the, you know, is sort of the area they need to focus on. And and just keep your eyes on the on the direction of U.S. Republicans too on this, because there is a lot of interest in the Ron DeSantis model of conservatism you know, being more activist with the state. You heard it this morning on Radio 4, you know, Conservatives saying they want to be more comfortable with the state, which, of course, Thatcher in some ways was, but, you know, in, in lots of ways she wasn't. Um, and they want to be more open at intervening in, you know, the institutions to level what they see as being, you know, a stacked deck in favour of uh, liberal graduates. But I'll, I'll leave it there and we can, we can resume. 
Thanks very much. I, I go on now to one from Patrick Davis, which I'll put to Ailsa to talk to, but talk around. Patrick asks whether the census shows that the public are confused between British and English and the change in the ordering of the census question doesn't show that there's anything significant, just people don't know what British and English are, perhaps. Um, Elsa, would you like to justify, perhaps not at huge length, because you've written a very long book about this, but actually the reality of these categories of British and English and the extent to which using that as a framework of analysis uh, is actually reflecting something quite robust? Yeah, I mean, it's an it's an important question um, because it touches on one thing we do know, which is that when in, in many ways, Englishness and Britishness are very tangled in people's minds. Uh, if you ask people what makes them proudest to be English and proudest to be British, they often mention exactly the same things. So they are tangled. And yet we know that English identifiers and British identifiers hold very different baskets of values and very different visions of the state. They are also in very different positions in terms of economic uh, left, right? So there's two different things going on. One is the elision and the tangling together. And the separate is how different groups who prefer one label over another approach um, approach the state. So the, the reason the census is troubling is, well, first of all, because they've changed the question order when it wasn't changed in the rest of the state. I think it, it uh, immediately imperils kind of evaluating trends over time, and it, it immediately makes more complicated any comparison across the across the state. So for as an exercise in social science, it's decision the decision making behind it, it, it still puzzles me. But done in England, it actually exacerbates uh, or it it, done in Scotland, it would not have been as bad because people in Scotland would would overlook the, whatever identity category was listed first on the list and would go digging for the Scottish label, um, even if it was listed fifth on the list. In England, because of the tangling, that's less likely to be the case. And you're more likely to get people engaging in a kind of satisfying, well, that identity is good enough. Yeah, Englishness, Britishness, whatever, I'll just pick whichever one is on top. And that's why the results from this census, but also the results from the last census are not reflected in any social science polling uh, on, national, on national identity. Can I just say something very quickly about Thatcherism. Yeah, um, please. One, because one thing that's different is is attitudes in Scotland. I mean, Thatcher, not necessarily Thatcher herself, but Thatcherism is widely attributed as 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 providing the engine behind the vote for devolution in 1997. A second Thatcherism could well be the engine that drives Scotland towards independence. It is seen as so different from the prevailing preferences, policy preferences and values in Scotland. Much of that is a myth. Much of the dif difference and distinctiveness about the Scottish electorate is a myth we tell ourselves and it doesn't always bear up to scrutiny, but it's seen as so contrary to Scottish political culture um, that it would, you know, attitudes to independence are quite sticky at the moment. They're just constantly um, stuck in and around the 50% mark, but a return to Thatcherism could well be what pushes it, pushes it onwards. Thank you. Lawrence, can I just come to you to take this discussion a bit further um, about identity and politics? One of the things you showed, which, as you said, most people hadn't actually realised, was that Labour actually won the 2019 election, or rather beat the Conservatives in 2019, <laughs> amongst those people who were more British than English in England. Um, looking at the other data we've had today, uh, do you get a sense, obviously Labour is doing better overall than it was back in 2019. That's clear from the opinion polls. But is there a sense of whether Labour is doing better, just, or rather whether it's re-skewing the balance back towards where it was in 2001 when they, being English and British didn't make very much difference? Or is your sense that Labour is doing better amongst all groups, but is still heavily dependent on those groups who are more British in their in, in their national identity? Uh, I think it's, I'll split the difference there. I'll say it's, um, it's somewhere between the two. Uh, I think it, if I'm, I'm going more on, because I, I haven't done the analysis of, oh, is it the more English that are moving back towards um, Labour, for example, since, um, since 2019, but I think you could go off um, 
uh, what what Paula is is showing, for example, um, with the the reemergence of labour among those with left authoritarian values, who you know you would heavily identify with uh, a more English than British uh, voter that is perhaps more likely to be located in the Red Wall, for example, and you could then um, uh, infer that yes, it probably would be more likely that they're gaining with the more English um, slightly more than they would be with um, uh, the the more British. But it's certainly true that they're gaining um, across the, the board. And so, um, you know, wh whether you want to do anything that upsets the apple cart and plays to any particular group, perhaps at the expense of another group, um, would be, you know, something that um, uh, would be quite questionable at this point in time. Thanks. Um, can I get an actual question from Peter Hain, uh, who asked, to what extent will culture war issues like gender recognition feature in the next general election? Uh, can the Tories drive a wedge into Labour on it? And perhaps we could take that slightly, I'd like you to ask the, the specific point, but take it more broadly. Um, where we have these cultural issues, when do they become politically salient? Uh, Paula's evidence was suggesting that they're not the driving factors at the moment. If we look back at Brexit, lots of people before 2016 knew that different parts of the electorate were Eurosceptic and others weren't, but didn't think it mattered because it seemed to be so down on everybody's list of priorities. So the, uh, could you, any of you respond on the particular issue about culture wars, such as gender recognition, but actually... What is it that makes these cultural divisions actually become the salient issues in an election? And given the overwhelming amount of bad news on the economy and public services, is there any chance of that happening in the short term? Um, Paula. Well, I'll take the, the short term point in particular. And I think the Conservatives might end up digging themselves into a bit of a hole here. One of the problems Labour had was people would keep asking them questions about gender recognition and so on. And voters would go, why are you talking about this? We don't care about this. And that's likely to happen even more so with the Conservatives. Why is the government talking about this when we can't pay our mortgages, when we phone for an ambulance and it doesn't turn up? We want these things fixed. Why are you focusing on these issues? And I think if the Conservatives try to push that agenda at this point as a way of um, attempting to dig into Labour's lead, they they really risk alienating even more voters in doing so because they're just not voter priorities at the moment. I'll let somebody else take the how do they become voter priorities part of that. I'll have a go. Yeah, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> let me let me let me present the counter. Um, I think when we often when we talk about issue salience, sometimes we talk about issue salience as though it's um, it's static lists of issues can't be moved. And if you look at um, Brexit, if you look at US politics, actually, the story around issue salience is often about political entrepreneurship. It's about a politician or a party being willing to exploit that particular issue. And you saw that in Scotland, too. I mean, most people ahead of the big debate over gender recognition would have said to you, this is a low salience question for me. It's a low salience issue. Indeed, you saw that in much of the polling. Um, now, if you then ask voters, once they become aware of that issue, how do you feel about this issue? Actually, the Scotland um, Gender Recognition Bill was, was not a 50-50 issue, it was an 80-20, meaning that only about 20% of voters were supportive, about 80% were opposed. Now, the moment Rishi Sunak, for different reasons, uh, mainly linked to the Equalities Act, decided to politicise that issue, decided to turn up the volume on that issue, actually we could see how suddenly voters tuned into it and they were suddenly aware of, oh, hang on a second, somebody wants to do something quite radical involving 16-year-olds and legally changing their gender. And it's not to say that went to a top three issue, but it's exactly the same dynamic that's played out, for example, in schooling and university policy in the US. Now, putting politics to one side, right? This is not, you know, just put politics to one side. If the Conservatives were clever, there are a number of issues on which they could exploit tensions within the Labour electorate that cut across left and right in a fairly similar way to Brexit. I'll give you one example from the, the BSA data. If you take a question in the BSA and you say to people, 
to what extent do you think equal opportunities have gone uh, too far or have not gone far enough for uh, minority groups, tran trans uh, gender people, um, uh, minority ethnic groups, you will, you will see a very sharp cultural divide um, between what we might call, you know, still the remain leave um, uh, rift, um, it, a similar divide to what we saw over uh, the Brexit question. Um, there are some conservatives in Western democracies that are willing to politicize those issues. Uh, and there are some conservatives that are not willing to do so. But I don't buy the argument that if they did, voters would say, I'd much rather you talk about the mortgage, because when you actually drill into what voters think about what we're teaching kids in school, what we're, what we're doing around sex and gender, how we think about our national history, how we think about who we are, John, and you've written about this, um, voters care passionately about these questions. And they don't simply say, well, I'm not going to allow, let this uh, influence my vote choice because it's not a top three issue in the salience list. It's a question of supply side. Who is going to supply voters uh, with the arguments on these issues to increase their salience? And I think fortunately for Labour at the moment, the Conservatives clearly don't want to do that. Um, but I'll leave it there. Can I okay, just, thank you. Can I yes, just jump uh, in? Elsa. Yeah. Um, first of all, in terms of when those issues are more likely to to have cut through, it's it's when there is a target audience, when there is an identifiable spokesperson or champion, when it connects to narratives about the nation's past, present and, and future, and when it is portrayed possibly as an obstacle to a positive trajectory for the nation, then they have then they have cut through. And particularly among those, it's when they can be connected to undue influence or undue access to the resource to resources. So to the extent that culture issues can be connected to something about the nation's trajectory and how it is bending it off where it might be otherwise, then I think they can have cut through. On the specific issue of GRR, I mean, I mentioned the, the balance of oppose and support. I think equally relevant are the, is the polling on salience. When you ask people, whether was this an issue that mattered to you? And the majority were saying, no, it wasn't. We remember if the UK government had intervened uh, to block legislation and it was related to health or it was related to education, I think there would have been uh, a reaction in Scotland. But it's notable that there was an only muted reaction in, in Scotland. After the Supreme Court case about holding an independence referendum, support for independence uh, went up. It's very we're seeing very little movement. So it was it was one of the few events recently where we've seen a substantial jump in support for an independence. After the GRR intervention by the UK government, support for independence actually decreased. Um, and so I think it was one instance where certain parts of the electorate were seeing a benefit of being in the union as a result of that. And certain parts of the of the cert, certainly certain parts of the electorate were reacting negatively to what they perceived as UK interference. But we also know there are segments of the electorate that were reacting positively to the fact that they felt the UK government in that instance had listened to them when the Scottish government had not. So I don't think it's an either or with culture issues. I think it it very much depends how they're framed. Thank you. I think that's three really good answers on the complexities of how these issues actually enter into politics in a way that matters. Elsa and Lawrence, I'm going to come back to you on the next one I made, which is Jamie Bilkley's question, which in essence is, you know, Labour has been moving arguably towards the right on cultural issues, perhaps to reclaim some of the ground that it had lost back in 2019. But it remains resolutely op opposed to talking about England as a nation in its language of politics. And I suppose my quest question to you, El Elsa, is, is, uh, is that, in your view, uh, a strategic mistake or doesn't it matter? And Lawrence, you highlighted in your presentation how this group of voters that Labour have lost in the past have quite distinct ideas particularly about national parliaments and the way that England's interests should be represented. Is your sense, and we're talking just about winning England here, we're not talking about the language for winning Scotland or winning Wales, that, that Labour would do better to some degree to have addressed those issues more explicitly? Uh, Elsa, can I come to you first, please? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we were 
uh, quite forceful about in the book is that a lot of what we're seeing in England uh, and, and the, the values and attitudes of those who describe themselves as English can be attributed to a, a, a clear sense of a lack of efficacy, a lack of political voice, a lack of English political voice, a lack of ability for voters in England to, to identify an English political community that is theirs. There is a sense that they are, to some extent, without a government of their own. Uh, and I think every time both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party deliberately conflate the behaviour of the UK government or policy and fail to identify when something applies only to England or when it applies across the whole of the UK or just to um, England and Wales in some instances, I think they do a disservice to the political community and I think they further annoy the English electorate. So I, I, I think it's... I think it's something that should be removed from the issue of strategy from one election to the next. I think it's also about how you govern a state. And I think we don't, we won't move on from a kind of ad hoc approach to how we govern the union and how we treat the union until we see serious political parties treating England as, as a distinct political community. Just before Lawrence comes in, Elsa, could I get you to pick up a related question from Simon Eden, which was, and it also relates to sort of Keir Starmer aligning take back control with devolution within England. Uh, is it actually devolution within England that English identifiers want or devolution to England in the sense of there being a national English political community? Yeah, it's a, it's an important it's an important point because there's two things going on. There's a demand for subsidiarity. So England is politically very centralized. There is absolutely a demand for subsidiarity for decisions more decisions to be taken at the lowest possible level. We know people's local identities are also important to them. And so some of those policies do address the subsidiarity point. What they fail to address is that there is a second movement which is a, a desire for the ability of an English political community to address itself, uh, uh, to govern itself as an English political community. So it addresses the subsidiarity point, but not the voice point. And that's, you can see what people are doing when they propose, um, when, when they um, propose different visions of uh, regional assemblies, for example, it's as if they're killing two birds with one stone, it's bringing decisions closer, and it's solving the voice point. But those regional solutions, in a way, address neither the subsidiarity point, because they don't bring the decision making low enough, and they don't address the English political voice point either, because they are below the level of England. So there's these there's territorial scale issues, and they're not quite pitched at the right level. Thank you. Lawrence. Um, yes, I mean, I, I would uh, sort of echo, um, echo much of that, really. I mean, it's um it's quite a, a challenging uh one to know because we, we don't have the you know the um the really the, the the sort of kind of experimental social science work that you want to do to determine like what is the effect of what would be the effect of labor endorsing um such an and such a policy um on its its vote choice we only have a scenario where they haven't endorsed a policy and uh, they voted one way or the other um but um i think um the uh the the, the devolution um point is is uh is important i mean we've got um yeah i mean it, it's really intriguing the way that um that starmer has tried to connect the the take back control um argument um to the the need for devolution but actually what we see is that um that will have the most appeal uh in terms of devolution to things like regional assemblies that will have more appeal to um his voter base than to uh attracting voters that have been lost to the uh conservative party what we see is that um there's a relationship between the um the more the more british um supporting more things such as regional assemblies and the more english preferring solutions such as uh, an english parliament uh for example also overall um and it's quite contentious um exactly how you should um word questions um in terms of presenting these different options for governance but overall um the the devolution option if you 
uh, if you, or sorry, the subnational devolution option, if you pitch it against the option of enhancing England's democracy via, you know, Parliament, for example, it is actually um, a fractionally less popular uh, solution um, with the English electorate uh, as a whole. Um, so I do wonder, you know, fundamentally, is Labour onto a winner here? Um, is it something that, um, you know, when it when it comes to um, the election time and people start digging into the details of manifestos, maybe not ordinary voters, but you know, they're publicised more um, on uh, on the media um, that we could see that as uh, a potential uh, vulnerability for Labour. Thank you. I, I'm going to pick up a question now from Richard Little, but extend it into a broader question, perhaps for all of the panellists. Richard asks, could a Le Pen type character get off the ground at the moment? And he then goes to ask and say, would that help more Labour candidates get past the post? So, I, But I suppose my, my the issue that comes from that is we've clearly got this group of voters, which I don't think there's much disagreement about, who don't feel terribly well represented within the political spectrum at, at, at the moment. Um, they may be shifting, but Paul, as people who are on the left economically and who are socially authoritarian, Matt's talked about them in, in a related way. Uh, if somebody was going to mobilize those voters, as arguably Johnson did back in 2019, is it likely to come from an external new voice rather as UKIP was back in the early 20s or maybe reform party aspires to be in that space at the moment or is it going to come from within conservatism or is this just the wrong time to try that sort of enterprise are we, are we UKIP in 1992 rather than UKIP in in 2012 um Matt, you've obviously given a lot of thought about the potential of this group, group to be mobilised. What do you see as the possible scenarios? Maybe the next, the next election, but you talked about the next 10 years, maybe over the next 10 years. Well, I think the first point I'd make is if you look across Western democracies, and I do think it's always useful to look at these things through a comparative lens. You know, when we wrote National Populism, we argued that these parties were likely to remain durable players. And that is what's happened. I mean, last year in France, Italy, Sweden, Portugal, Spain, these parties have achieved, achieved and Hungary, new record levels of support. I mean, they're entrenched players, even as the salience of issues has increased and decreased, even as immigration, for example, has risen and fallen. Now, I accept the point that Britain is liberalising a bit quicker than many other European nations and that might deprive that kind of party of of political demand i i certainly am i'm open to that but i think there are two things that are going on that are interesting one is there is clearly a push underway <coughs> within the conservative party to fundamentally change the axis of conservative politics if you speak to most conservative mps they either assume they're going to lose the next election and that will follow be followed by a philosophical toss, um, civil war over what is conservatism um, and there is an acceptance that going back to David Cameron type, you know, <coughs> liberal conservatism is not going to be, you know, the way forward. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind. There is a, the possibility of a reshaping of British conservative politics over the next five to 10 years. The second possibility, which you, you allude to, is, is some kind of in, insurgency from outside. But of course, that's very, very difficult because in the aftermath of Brexit, we don't have European Parliament elections. So it's first past the post or bust. The only people who have tried to do that in the past, such as Nigel Farage, have very little appetite in trying to do it again, precisely because they've removed the main springboard that they had into getting national visibility, which is those PR style European Parliament elections. So I think it is essentially you know, watching the internal reconfiguration of the Conservatives with some interest, because, as I say, you look at the Republicans, you look at the Italians, you look at the French. There is a reconfiguration of centre-right politics happening at the moment, and it isn't about Thatcherism, and it isn't about Cameroonism. It is about, I think, these parties gradually accepting that if they want to continue with the realignment, uh, and that this realignment, remember, is more global than just about Brexit and Corbyn, then they need to patch together a series of policies that will speak to, the, to that cross-class coalition of voters in a compelling way. And, and just lastly, John, the one thing 
I think and I think Keir Starmer personally has done a brilliant job of repositioning the Labour Party. But the one thing he did last week that made me sit up and take notice is in the five missions that he outlined, he didn't mention immigration at all. Now, you could take Paula's view and say, well, that's because it's a low salience issue. Why should they mention it? But as we can see with the small boats and with the changing um, debate about migration and borders, which I think, you know, this is a prediction that may come back to haunt me, but it is only going to become more salient as we go through the next few years. I think Keir Starmer may look back at that moment and wish he'd not left Rishi Sunak with a big open goal on that question. Paul, I'm going to go to you and chuck in a slight extra one because the one from Charlie Hayes, essentially, is Labour doing well on these issues and on the NHS and the economy because the government is perceived as doing badly? And that's perhaps part of Matt's suggestion that Labour isn't necessarily constructing a platform that's designed to appeal to the voters who be, who are alienated on some of these issues at the moment. But what, what are the prospects for the the underrepresented group of voters becoming more politically significant as they have done in the past? Okay, so they're, they're two quite distinct questions and I'd prepared an answer for the first one. So I'll go with that first of all. And yes, that, just answer the one then. <laughs> that was thinking about groups of voters that are missing from our political debate who could be mobilized and the parallels with France. So the group of voters most missing from our political debate are young people without degrees. Okay, we have what, about 50% young people now going into higher education. We assume all young people are liberal and have degrees, but it's not true. It's just the fact that most of those people that without degrees who are young don't vote. The turnout amongst those groups is pitiful. Um, but they could be mobilized, as I believe. I'm not, I'm not a comparative specialist, nor am I a French specialist, but I believe that the age gradient for Le Pen is the reverse of what we would expect given our age gradient here. And that's because she was able to bring a leftish economic offer to young people in those kinds of positions. And I think that's a group that could be mobilized that isn't currently. And I think it's a group that we should know more about and we know very little about them because they don't turn up in all our surveys because we they just don't engage with politics at all. So they're a group that we don't know very much about. In terms of the Labour Party doing well because um, the government are doing badly, I've literally just written a piece about that this morning. Um, and I think it is, it's partly because the government are doing badly. But I think if it was just that, if it was just pure anti-conservatism that we were seeing, we would expect to see that conservative 2019 vote kind of fragmenting. We'd expect to see a bit more going to the Lib Dems as a protest, a bit more going to the Greens as a protest. What seems to be underlying it is not necessarily huge enthusiasm for Labour, but huge enthusiasm for a different government. And people only see the Labour Party as being able to deliver as a different government. Um, and that, I think, potentially poses problems for Labour should they win the next election as to how they then generate enthusiasm to be able to govern beyond a single term. I'm not sure if I answered all the questions, but hopefully. No, no, you, you covered a huge amount of ground brilliantly there. Uh, Ailsa, what, what's, what's your sense? I mean, you, you were writing about voters who felt they had no efficacy uh, years ago. Um, where, where do you see the potential for them to go in the future? Where do I see the potential for voters who have no efficacy to vote in the future or? Well, yeah, I mean, I, whether they're likely to, to remain, I mean, arguably, obviously lots of them by definition don't vote, but some of them did vote in 2019 in England for the Conservatives. Some of them at least are going to vote for other parties this time, uh, predominantly Labour. But it seems from the evidence we've had today that none of these people are really saying, I've now found the party that absolutely represents what I stand for socially, culturally and economically. And so what do you think the chances are that somebody will create an outlet or they will find an outlet for their mm. politics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, th I think exit is as likely an option as anything else. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why we put in that kind of hypothetical question about if you were living somewhere else in the UK, who would you vote for? Um, because if you are, if your vote, if thinking of a, as a party, if your vote is rock solid, then your voters will continue to vote for you, regardless of where in the UK they live. 
But it, what the size of the don't know is that we see on those hypothetical situations suggests that partisanship is is a fickle thing, um, or rather is a weak thing at the moment. And so I think exit is as likely an option as any other. Mm. I also okay. think this Conservative Party is a very different thing in different parts of the UK. You know, wh when you're yeah. describing the Conservative Party, what you're describing is the Conservative Party in England. You're not really describing the Conservative Party in Scotland, which seems to have found itself a, 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 a niche in terms of talking about the union that is quite remarkable in its um, in its muscular unionism, they if if the Conservative Party is pivoting away from muscular unionism, if the UK government is pivoting away from muscular unionism, there are no real signs that the Scottish Conservative Party is doing it. If you look at the views that they hold, the supporters hold, they are less pluralist in their vision of the UK state than supporters of the DUP. Scotland remains the most polarized part of the. United Kingdom at the moment on a whole range of issues, many of them connected to um, to constitutional issues. So what happens to the Conservative Party is in a way what happens to um, the Conservative Party in England. I think the movements we're seeing aren't really happening to the same extent in Scotland. Thank you. And Lawrence, if I could throw in a slightly different twist in your presentation, one of the things you showed was not just that the English identifiers were more socially conservative, albeit becoming more liberal uh, over time than the more British, but there was a sharper divergence amongst the more British in terms of their liberal attitudes. Uh, looking at that, how, how difficult do you see it for Labour to hold together the coalition that it's now apparently building across the different identities and the different cultural groups, perhaps because of the dominance of, of economic and public service issues? uh okay um yeah that's um that's an interesting question i suppose the 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 key challenges to holding together a coalition perhaps don't uh come uh to to bear when you're in opposition i think they're, they're perhaps more likely to come to bear um when you're in government um and there's a concept of the you know the the costs of governing where you know obviously governments have to make choices and um and their choices success successively may alienate you know individual um uh, blocks of of voters um they can't please everyone when they're in opposition they can you know try to some extent to do these um these delicate uh dances around uh certain issues and certainly they can at the moment um just uh, have had some success in just diverting everything um, to uh, to economic questions and saying this is fundamentally what voters care about and this is what we want to uh, talk about. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I caught the whole of the question. So could you just repeat it for me? No, it's 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 okay. I was I I think you're probably answering it. I was really just highlighting something from your your evidence showing that. Um, it's not just there are differences in meanings between mm. different national identities, which is the framework that you mm. looked at, but actually some of these they're diverging quite quite markedly in a way which makes it mm. challenging for 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 different groups of people. Yes, but, and, but and, and may, that, maybe it will fine. be I mean, maybe I, it will be the case that um, you know if um, if these trends were to continue, you could end up with Labour voters being in a really substantially liberal. Um, space um or at least uh, you know in in five or or ten years time at which point you'd have you know a, a lot of pressure to do things such as for example um rejoin the european union or at least the uh the single market and at the point where you have to say yes or no to those voters quite definitively um then perhaps that is the sort of point where um uh you actually do risk um splitting your um your carefully constructed coalition um but we don't know exactly with if, if those trends will uh will continue because there's, there's it's possible that um i suppose one of two things could be true one could be that it could be firm static uh or sorry uh, this is some political science jargon coming out here but a firm static uh response to um seeing um conservative party policy um, or uh, having the Conservatives in government for an extended period of time and um, people uh, moving against um, uh, conservative um, 
uh, social positions. The other one could be that um, uh, that. Um, uh, and sorry, the extension of the thermostatic argument being that if labour gets in, um, uh, people start to think over time that things have moved too far to the left or to the liberal direction on social issues as well. And so they respond in, in that way. The other possibility could be that it's a response to um, the, uh, the increased prominence of the, raf the radical right, um, at least over the past um, uh, at least over the period um, of UKIP and Brexit, um, people um, wanted, you know, there, there were certain people, particularly this um, this graduate, um, younger graduate uh, cadre, um, that, you know, were particularly d defined their values strongly against that, and so perhaps became more pro-immigration in response to the negative messaging that they may have seen from um, parties and in the media. Um, and so it partly depends on, um, you know, uh, is there is there an outgroup that they want to continue defining themselves against, and how strongly do they want to define themselves against that um, sort of reactionary force in society that then they may have seen as gaining so much prominence during Brexit and Trump. Um, thank okay, you. thank you very much. And I'm going to need to draw it to a close here uh, that's been a very very rich discussion without reprising it um reprising it. it it's quite clear that beneath the headline polls we see of labor leads of 20 percent or whatever there's an awful lot going on and the extent to which different voters really would now feel they had found the home they want to be in varies quite considerably across the electorate and that in turn means there are the next election or beyond, all sorts of factors are still in play about ideas of the nation, politics, economics, and so on. And I think we've done, or the panel at least, has done a fantastic job this afternoon in identifying and showing where the discussion lies in uh, many of those many of those areas. So can I thank everybody for joining us? We will make the uh, recording available on the website as soon as possible. And thank you very much indeed, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>